Excellent. So thank you, everybody, um, for joining us today for, for this week's uh, Magnet Seminar. Uh, it's another great uh, turnout of people uh, this week. There are a lot of new people uh, who haven't joined our seminars before. So for those who are new to Magnets, our presentations are on the order of about 25 to 30 minutes or so. And I kindly ask that you keep your microphones muted uh, during the presentation so as not to disturb the presenter. If you're having any issues with uh, your internet uh, connection, I would recommend turning your camera off and that can help to improve things. At the end of the, the presentation, we'll have a 10 to 15 minute uh, discussion and question section. I will invite you to unmute uh, to ask any questions, but feel free to type in questions into the chat and uh, one of the hosts, uh, probably myself, will read out the question uh, on your behalf. And as always with the Magnet Seminars, at the end of, of, of the, the talk, we have time for a bit of a catch up, an informal uh, social, social session, which isn't recorded. So please, uh, if you have a bit of time, hang around just to at least say hello to, to various people. So today I'm pleased to say that we've got uh, John Tarduno from the University of Rochester, who will be talking today about robust hotspot origins far from LLSVP margins. And so I'll hand over to you, John. All right, uh, thank you. Um, okay, can you see my screen or can you? You will need to redo the share. Okay. Perfect, we can see that. Okay, now. yeah. So uh, thanks uh, so much for, for coming today. What I'd like to do today is to kind of review some some old um, studies um, and really kind of put them in the context of, of some um, newer studies that I'll get to uh, at the end to really kind of address this question of, and it may be in a different way than you've heard before about a hotspot origin um, and LLSVP uh, margins. So, um, I think this idea can be attributed to Kevin Burke um, and then Tron um, um, got involved with Kevin. Um, Kevin certainly talked to me about it early on um, and my suspicion, unfortunately, he never got a chance to ask Kevin about this, is that Kevin actually was motivated in turn um, by a few um, lines that were in one of Jason Morgan's um, early papers. But the point was that um, perhaps uh, uh, hotspots are uh, formed at the edges of the large low shear velocity provinces. And um, this was laid out in a paper by Kevin and then subsequently uh, Kevin and Tron and, and subsequently in several papers by, by Tron's group. Now, this idea, however, just the basic distribution of hotspots uh, as shown here uh, relative to um, the large low shear velocity provinces has been challenged. Um, some of the early challenges are shown here, and these continue just in terms of the statistics. Um, some clearly don't um, uh, agree at all with large low shear velocity provinces. And there has been this kind of back and forth in terms of whether or not um, there is a statistically significant um, correlation um, on that. I'm not really going to talk about that uh, so much as uh, the question about, um, which I'll get to in a moment, uh, there are hotspots and there are hotspots. Um, uh, there's certain rankings that we can make of these. The second question, which I think is, is equally interesting, um, and I think, you know, paleomagnetism still has a lot to play on this, is really uh, the whole question about whether or not LL, well, what are LL SVPs? Do they reflect the crystallization of a, a basal a magma ocean? Are they stable? Can they provide a, um, a frame of reference for plate tectonics as, as, as Trond and his group have um, proposed? Um, the other idea, of course, is that they they are not um, uh, stable uh, and they're relatively new in terms of the age of the Earth. That is, they are a product of post-Pangaea subduction. And um, the group in Australia has been uh, proposing this um, for a number of years and continues to point out, uh, in their view, 
that uh, the modern distribution of, of large low shear velocity provinces, particularly the African uh, large low shear velocity province, can be reproduced by just uh, post Pangaea subduction. So this is the way I view the issue, however, is that when we look at hotspots, um, we should really rank them by their buoyancy flux. And I've really just taken the top ones here. And in all uh, analyses of hotspots, and this is not disputed within the community, um, there's Hawaii and there's everything else. You know, Hawaii is uh, just dwarfs the others in terms of its buoyancy flux. Uh, there are a couple of others that I've, I've um, mentioned here, which I'll touch on, McDonald and Iceland. But uh, everything else is really kind of in this, you know, 1.6 kind of range. Uh, so I would argue that if you want to explain the origin of hotspots, uh, hotspot formation, you probably should be able to explain uh, the most important one in terms of its buoyancy flux, that is Hawaii. And this gets then to the question of Hawaii. And um, of course, uh, you know, starting from work in the uh, 95 and 97, we uh, suggested that the Hawaiian hotspot had actually moved southward. There were prior suggestions about hotspot motion, um, but because of the data sets used to generate these, it wasn't clear whether or not the hotspots in the Pacific or the hotspots in the Atlantic were moving, and we specifically um, called on a Hawaiian hotspot motion, and this agreed with um, some of the early models of Bernard Steinberger. Uh, and what is shown here is um, on the uh, lower left is the predictions of what the Hawaiian hotspot would uh, look like based on various uh, plate circuit models. And then you can see, of course, they don't agree at all with the actual hotspot uh, motion, the hotspot itself. Um, but um, all of this was challenged and uh, we really needed to get more data uh, to accept this. Um, just bear in mind this picture of this prediction because we'll, we'll return to that in a little bit. So this led to leg 197, where we went out and uh, drilled the emperor uh, seamounts, and uh, we were able to confirm the previous ideas, where if we look at latitude, the fixed hotspot should all be um, falling along this line, but instead they do not. Uh, they have a trend, in fact, uh, suggesting a rapid uh, hotspot motion. And more recently, um, this was summarized uh, in, a, in a paper by Richard Bono. Um, Richard really addressed this question, even based on the prior data. Um, some people were trying to say, well, maybe um, these data are compatible with motions uh, that are down here. And uh, Richard did the formal analysis of a Bayesian approach and um, was able to estimate the errors and, and showed that in fact, um, the most probable value is actually a very high uh, um, uh, rate of motion. And um, if you really want to talk about these very lower rates, you're talking about things that are way out here um, beyond 99.9% .9 confidence and, and quite unlikely. So the most likely value is this very high uh, rate of, of, of motion. So moving forward from that, I think the next um, kind of major advance was really the the work um, from drilling the uh, Louisville Seamount um, chain and summarized by uh, Anthony Cooper's work. And what they found instead was that the Louisville, which has a very different um, morphology to it, uh, had not moved very much uh, uh, relative to the spin axis, three to five degrees. Um, and this um, Motion, of course, uh, doesn't really support any kind of true polar wander explanations because there should be more motion uh, along that. But more importantly, it, it suggested a very simple test. If the, um, the Louisville chain here is uh, relatively stable relative to the spin axis, it's not moving relatively mu um, much. During this same time interval when the Hawaiian hotspot is moving ra rapidly southward, this provides a means to actually independently test the motion. And the way uh, to do that is to look at seamounts of the two trends that are of the same age. 
And if the Hawaiian hotspot actually had been moving south, we, one would expect that the distances between these hotspots on different tracks should be decreasing. So um, a fairly straightforward test, uh, not based on paleomagnetism. And, um, okay, why not go further? There we go. Uh, fortunately, over, um, over uh, more than a decade, uh, Anthony Coppers and others uh, have been uh, generating data, uh, a whole series of new age dates from the Louisville as well as from the Emperor Seamounts. And this was separated, this was um, uh, um, reported in a paper by Conrad and, and others. And we're able to now use these age dates. And uh, what we see here is, um, I think quite a remarkable thing is, is now what we're see, seeing um, on the right is in fact uh, during this time interval where we see this very rapid um, uh, plate motion defined or hotspot motion defined by um, uh, paleomagnetism, we see the distance between seamounts of these two trains, um, two chains uh, changing and decreasing. So exactly as would be expected by uh, if the Hawaiian hotspot had been moving uh, to the south. So I think this is a uh, nice confirming evidence um, that that that's not what we, that we're not um, actually having a stable hotspot. Now, I, I really don't want to talk much about um, the Hawaiian emperor bend, but just to point out that um, uh, this is the platform of the Hawaiian um, uh, emperor train. Uh, the reason that the Hawaiian Emperor Ben has been such an interest is because of its very sharpness, as we see here. If we were to take out the hotspot motion component of it using the plate circuits, this is what the trend looks like. So um, is there a Hawaiian Emperor Ben? Well, there might be something uh, in here uh, as other bands, but this is our view of the problem. Um, I think if we want to look at this and say, what is the major feature that's causing the Hawaiian Emperor Bend? We would say uh, still that it's hotspot motion. We're not excluding that there are some small changes of plate motion here and in other places, but we don't think it's the actual major um, um, cause of the morphology. Now, but to return more to the topic, um, if the Hawaiian hotspot you know, originated up here someplace, it did not originate on the edge of the large low shear velocity province. However, it is there now. So, so that's kind of the take, first take home message here. When you hear people talking about hotspot origin on the edges of large low shear velocity provinces, our most robust hotspot doesn't meet that, okay? However, it is on the edge and that's really interesting. Now, why did the Hawaiian hotspot move southward? Uh, there are various ideas on this. Um, this is uh, work from the uh, Caltel, Caltech group uh, that suggested that there was um, asymmetric deformation of the large shear velocity province, setting up some type of flow that would actually bring uh, the Hawaiian hotspot further south. We have talked about uh, influences of ridges. So different ideas um, out there for explaining this. but. What, one thing I want to, um, to highlight is really a, a geochemistry um, uh, paper. This is by uh, Harrison and, and Weiss and others. And I think this is a really fascinating uh, paper and idea. And so we've known for a very long time that the Hawaiian uh, lavas, uh, best represented by on the island of Hawaii itself, actually have two geochemical trends, uh, the so-called uh, Loa trend and the Kea trend. And there are various ideas to actually produce this. But um, what's less recognized is that these two trends are not seen on the emperor seamounts. Okay, we just see the, the Kea trend. So the, the Loa trend is a later, it has a time signature. It is a lower, um, it is a later feature and it, it is seen intermittently on the uh, Hawaiian trend. So um, the idea of Harrison and, and Weiss and others is that um, perhaps the Hawaiian plume moved southward and then eventually became um, 
anchored to the uh, large low shear velocity problems. And then um, there was starting, then there started to be entrainment of material from the, um, the large low shear velocity province itself. And that's why we have these two trends. Um, I think it's, a, it's an intriguing idea and it's of course uh, consistent with uh, our ideas in terms of the motion of the Hawaiian hotspot. Um, I think in more in general, uh, this idea of hotspot clustering um, is, is probably um, has a lot more to do with the formation and the, the, the plan form of, of large low shear velocity provinces than we might normally think. I mean, there are some people who believe, particularly the African uh, large low shear velocity provinces, that it's just a collection of plumes. And with various smearing, uh, these things have kind of come together and that's the actual, um, you know, most of what we're actually seeing in, in the plume. Um, irrespective of that, I think there is, is plenty of evidence that if we have an upwelling, there will, will be a trend. And this is just a, a model from Yuli Hansen um, that these models haven't really changed much with time, that um, if we have a central upwelling, there will be a tendency for plumes to move toward uh, that central uh, upwelling. And this may be uh, another factor for the motion of the Hawaiian emperor, um, uh, the Hawaiian plume. Okay, so getting to our question about whether or not hotspots form on large low shear velocity province margins, I think Hawaii um, did not, it moved. Uh, what about McDonald? Um, McDonald is actually in the center uh, or close to the center of large low shear velocity province. So again, it's not really on a margin, it's kind of more central to this. So again, it's, it's in the interior. So that's not a, not a, not a margin example. Um, what about Iceland? Uh, I could give an entire talk on Iceland. I, I won't do that. Um, but, you know, Iceland is up here. And to really say that this is on the edge of the large low shear velocity province is literally a stretch. Um, you're really kind of stretching the seismology to kind of bring it up there. I don't think it is uh, on the margin. Um, from our work, um, you know, are there actually older um, uh, volcanics uh, linked to the large low shear velocity province? Um, you know, there has been suggestions, and we have talked about this, about whether or not Arctic volcanism can be linked to um, to the uh, Iceland hotspot. Um, if there is this linkage, uh, this makes this correlation uh, somewhat uh, uh, even more problematic because we know from paleomagnetic analysis that it formed further to the north. So if we want to move um, a hotspot that would have originally formed these volcanics up here and maybe even Alpha Ridge, it would have moved uh, at least uh, a thousand kilometers further uh, to the south. So again, I don't believe Iceland is a good example of a hotspot that formed on a large low shear velocity margin. It's uh, it's something very, very different. So again, I um, I would say of these three um, kind of high buoyancy flux hotspots, they don't meet the criteria for forming on uh, this margin. So um, as we said before, as I said before, this had been challenged just in terms of statistics. Um, I'm not claiming that uh, there aren't some hotspots, um, some small buoyancy flux ones that could uh, not form along this, um, but I don't think that this is the uh, formation mechanism for uh, the really robust hotspots. And I think uh, uh, that's an important um, issue. Now, um, you know, this question about whether or not uh, the large low shear velocity provinces are a product of post-Pangea subduction. Um, you know, we would tend to think that, in fact, um, they probably are. And um, now, in our view, the Hawaiian hotspot has moved uh, 1,500 kilometers to the south, uh, so it can be on the edge. But more generally, um, we tend to favor the idea that large low shear velocity provinces are these collections of plumes, um, like we might see here. Um, and they can be reshaped by mantle uh, circulation, particularly if plumes are moving closer to the center of an upwelling. 
And uh, these large old shear velocity provinces just may record clusters of hotspots that have moved toward these upwellings. And I think as we get higher and higher resolution uh, seismology, that's probably what is uh, going to be the case, that we, we see that there are really kind of groupings of these, um, of these hotspots and um, supporting this uh, um, post-Pangea origin. Uh, finally, which I won't um, talk about here, but it's outlined in Richard Bono's paper, there is data uh, from the emperor trend that suggests that um, there could be a, uh, a large scale motion of the um, African uh, group of hotspots uh, relative to the group of hotspots in, um, in the Pacific. And this would, by definition, also represent the motion of this large shear velocity province versus uh, the one in the Pacific. However, you know, I will put a caveat on that is, you know, what is the large shear velocity province? It's really, uh, in our view, this collection of these plumes and associated chemical and thermal uh, anomalies. Okay. Um, now, what about this point about the basal magma ocean? Um, I would like to say that I'm not saying that the mantle heterogeneity is associated with the bas uh, basal magma ocean have not survived. Um, I think uh, the geochemistry argues quite convincingly they have survived. So this is just the um, one of the, the original papers that people can constantly refer back to as they should by the Mbrus and others that suggested that we have a, a basal magma ocean. This is gradually cooling and breaking up into uh, uh, various sectors. Um, the difference of opinion, I would say, is that I don't think that the, our present large low shear velocity provinces represent um, uh, these uh, remnants. Okay, uh, there could be some of these remnants embedded within the present day large low shear velocity provinces. And the reason that we see geochemical anomalies is because there are plumes coming up from these. But there are probably other uh, large, low, I mean, the, these kind of primitive uh, relics that are in other places of um, the lowermost mantle that are not associated with present day large low shear velocity provinces because they have just not happened to have had the um, accumulation of slabs in that place um, uh, over the last, let's say, 400 million years, which is a number which uh, I think is relevant um, uh, for the following uh, point. Okay, um, I'd like to end with just a very different way of actually looking at this question. And um, turning around um, some work that we recently published, and, and to really ask the question, is the origin of the modern large shear velocity provinces recorded in the inner core? Now, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, this may sound like a somewhat bizarre suggestion, but uh, the beginning part of this is that you need to um, uh, understand, if you haven't um, been keeping up with this literature, is that, um, the seismological evidence seems to be coalescing that there is actually an innermost uh, inner core and an outermost inner core. Now, this dates back to work from the 1980s, uh, but it's really the seismic core anisotropy data that seem to have become developing and becoming more convincing. So that at, at about a radius, about half the inner core uh, radius, the, uh, there's a change in the slow direction uh, to about 54 degrees relative to the rotation axis. And that seems to be a robust uh, result. Now, um, there is reason to believe that um, from various arguments of, of modeling, as well as some from seismology, that the, the present day seismic core anisotropy, which is really reflecting the texturing of inner core growth, is reflected uh, or is reflective of the um, degree two structure of the deep mantle. That is right now we have a degree two, degree two structure of the low and most mantle, which is defined by these large low shear velocity provinces. If that's the case, this suggests that maybe before this time, because there doesn't seem to be any strong evidence that there could be a phase change, um, there was a different uh, texturing and a different um, 
deep mantle degree structure, maybe a degree one pattern. Now, what our group has been doing is trying to date this um, and um, to date the inner core growth, because that's really the inner, the, the, the start, I think, of trying to understand the temporal relationship of when this change of the innermost inner core and the outermost inner core may have occurred. Um, and the start of this really is, is kind of Richard Bono's work um, uh, and what Richard was able to, to, uh, and to find really for the first time was this ultra low field value, a time average value for the Edia Karen. Uh, and uh, what was summarized in Richard's paper was really a review of uh, the paleo intensity data and people have different opinions on this, different selection criteria, and that's, that's fine. What our view is is kind of shown here, and uh, what was done here was to actually look for time average data, and the single crystal paleo intensity values are shown in blue, and the larger figures figures are the time average values, and other time average values are shown in the larger uh, symbols here, and, the, and some of the acceptable um, uh, um, non time average values are shown by smaller values. The suggestion here uh, that was outlined in Richard's paper was that there was actually a long-term trend with superimposed variations, as we might expect by um, shorter-term changes in core mantle boundary affecting the efficiency of the dynamo. But still, there was sort of this relentless uh, trend from a relatively high field in the uh, late Archean uh, to the ED Karen when the field almost collapsed. This uh, ultra low field value is 10 times less than the present day field value. And Richard suggested that this is the fingerprint of the inner core growth. And one of the other reasons for suggesting this was of course this um, really nice correlation. Now time is moving the other way uh, with a completely independent uh, uh, data, uh, a way of looking at things. This is the modeling work of uh, Peter Driscoll that suggested that there would be this long-term trend and then the field would actually almost collapse reaching what we call a weak field state or close to the weak field state where the kinetic energy exceeds the magnetic energy. And then, and then there would be a relatively rapid rebound with inner core uh, growth. Uh, so the data uh, to first order uh, agreed uh, with that, uh, that prediction. Now, uh, since that time, uh, Richard's um, work, uh, there has been um, much more work by other groups. A, large of this, a lot of this work has been done in Liverpool and summarized by uh, Ting Han Zhu, shown here, uh, and um, in general agreement. Now, uh, importantly, this ultra low field value is actually found in many places uh, um, from North America, uh, Ukraine, and there are gonna be more uh, reports of this. So um, lots of room to get collect more data, but uh, lots of data here now suggesting these uh, low uh, field values. And we, we think that that's actually pretty exciting. Um, now, what, what Ting Hong was able to, to uh, um, in particular contribute was uh, looking at uh, uh, younger data, slightly younger data, Cambrian in age. And what she was able to find was that there was a rebound of the field in a relatively short amount of time uh, to values that now that are, are higher, uh, these VDM values, than this ultra low field value. And this is what one would expect if the inner core started to grow, because we would now have these new sources of energy from latent heat re release and um, compositional convection uh, to kind of provide uh, new vigor to the dynamo and a jump up in the paleo intensity. So this is the model that, um, on, and the data actually that Ting Hong showed. But now having that, this allows us to kind of probe in more depth this question. That is uh, based on the constraints that were available here, now we can uh, estimate an intercore uh, onset age. Uh, in this paper, we suggested 550 million years. Um, and that now allows us to assign a date to when uh, this uh, could have actually grown, the inner core could have actually grown to roughly half its time size, corresponding to the seismic change uh, of the um, innermost inner core and the outermost inner core. And that these numbers come out to be approximately 450 million years uh, old. 
So we would say that um, the present day um, mantle structure um, may have started to form somewhere about 450 million years ago. And that the large low shear velocity problem, it's, it's at least the, 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 as we see them today, today with a degree due structure are probably no older uh, than that age. Um, and we think that uh, the imprint of this uh, deeper mantle structure um, and probably is a degree one pattern uh, that is, uh, was present during the very beginning of the inner core growth uh, to this change at around 450 million years. At least that's our hypothesis right now um, based on the available data. And this is all laid out in the paper uh, by, by Ten Hong. Uh, that was in Nature uh, Communications. That's actually 2022. Sorry uh, for that. Uh, but Ting Hong is continuing to work on this. So um, with that, I would like to uh, just mention some of our um, our supporters, uh, both on our work in hotspots, a range, uh, National Science Foundation, and of course, IODP, um, and our partners in, up, up in the Arctic. And our ongoing work in the inner core, a whole host of universities that are actually involved in trying to uh, really um, uh, get a better record uh, through this interval, critical interval of the Neo-Proterozoic into the Cambrian to understand the uh, paleo intensity record. So uh, with that, I'll uh, thank you for your attention and happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you very much, John. That was a, a really interesting and exciting talk. I think we can all uh, give John a, a virtual round of applause um, before we move on to any questions. So uh, I'll open the floor to anybody with a question. You have the option to either type it into the chat or to uh, raise your hand uh, and I'll ask you to unmute. Well, if nobody has an immediate question, I, I, I will kick off with one myself while everyone else um, cogitates a little bit. So, so you've been looking at, at, at um, three hotspots in particular and ranking them based around their, their buoyancy flux. I mean, are there any um, hotspots, you know, at the margins of these um, LLSVPs that have a moderate or high um, buoyancy flux? But there is evidence that they haven't undergone any movement. Yeah. So, so the only one that I would say that there, there's only one that I'm aware of, and that's a far. Mm -hmm. And a far is relatively young, and um, I, you know, I would love to know what a far is doing and is connecting to it, its deeper mantle structure. But uh, everything else is much, much less. So, uh, but to be fair, yeah, a far is is a question mark. It it has you know a buoyancy flux depending on the on the analysis, you know, somewhere between two and three. Um, it's nothing like Hawaii, but um, you know, a far would be the one that you know, in the course, you know, it's it's engaged in, in splitting up a continent, perhaps. So, so I think um, you know, what what is the connection of that that present day? Um, you know, upper mantle structure to deeper mantle structure is a, is a, you know, you really need to understand that, um, I would say, to understand more about um, this overall question. And of course, there are some people who suggest that, you know, maybe a far isn't really connected to the deep mantle. So it's, uh, um, I won't get into that argument, but it is, it is a, um, a question. Um Kathy Gonsville, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just have a, a quick clarification question, John. Can you remind us where all these buoyancy flux estimates come from? How they how they're calculated? Um, yeah, so so the original ones were from sleep, where he used hotspot swells. Um, but uh the more recent one is from Scott King's work. Um, so, um, you know, Scott revisited that work and recalculated those. That work is, is published, I believe, in EPSL. Um, so it's, um, I'm not aware of a new compilation since that time. So, so do you have any ideas of their accuracy? <laughs> um, 
I'm very confident that Hawaii is much higher than anything else. Um, you know, uh, yeah. uh, besides, um, and that's why I, I was a little bit um, hesitant on some of my answers to, to Greg's question about uh, Afar. I think Afar gets very tricky when you're right there and, and involved with splitting up a continent and, and knowing what yeah. that buoyancy flux number is. Of course, the buoyancy flux is much easier to get a handle on an, an oceanic lithosphere than they are in continental lithosphere. So, um, or at least it's more straightforward to document um, the data that you're using uh, from them. So I think um, the buoyancy fluxes in the continental ones, I think are much more uncertain, I would say that. Um, the ones in the continental areas have tended to remain stable over many studies. That's all I'll say. Okay. I mean, I, uh, uh, Scott does actually assign some numbers, I believe, in, in terms of his error bounds, um, and and um, so so you can find some information there. Well, thanks very much. We have uh, time for, for a couple more questions. If anyone has one, if not, I have a, I have a list right right here. I'm more than <laughs> happy to ask. So <laughs> okay, I'll give people another opportunity. But um, I guess the you know this this idea of of the switching in in the degree pattern of of uh, effectively heat flux at the core map of boundaries is, is is kind of quite intriguing. I mean, I guess and this is you know going to be a speculative question. I mean, how far back would you necessarily expect or or would we be able to constrain this sort of inferred degree one pattern? I guess you know. You're talking about a switching that's over, you know, 400, 500 million years in in sort of modern configuration yep. compared to, you know, billion year time scale of 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 um, times before that. Um, how consistent might you expect that degree one pattern be going back in time? So, if we're right, you know, the 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 pattern. Um, that we're seeing that's trapped in the innermost inner core is not present for a very long amount of time, right? But that pattern then had to reflect an earlier history, right? You would say at least one ocean overturn time, you know, at least 200 million years. So, so now you're getting to the question of, you know, are plate reconstructions accurate enough to be able to say anything about this? And, um, you know, there is a hint in the present, uh, and lots of people working on this, um, that there is such a change, uh, you know, at at 450 million years. Um, but yeah, there's lots of caveats we always have to make on this because we've lost all oceanic crust, and we're making assumptions on this based on paleomagnetism. Um, I would tend to look at it the other way around is that you know we have this change in the inner core um and it you know the one way to explain this is the difference in the texturing of iron that's actually occurring due to a change in that core mantle boundary um structure you know isn't it interesting that this seems to have at least some correlation with the predictions of the plate motions that are available so far i mean that's that's kind of how I look at it right now, but um, the plate reconstructions there there are there are model choices. There are great changes in this. However, having said this, you know the degree two structure really. I mean, the degree one structure really means that you're you know you're more or less having you know an area that you know two different um, you know hemispheres and and maybe that can at least we can get some inferences on that based on kind of even the crudest plate reconstructions but i mean i think this should be i think motivation for people to you know really work on on kind of increasing these uh the resolution of this as much as we can and and um i think you know a lot of people are working on this and i'm um it's a i think a, a great area where you know, both tectonics are important, and as we've tried to make the argument, you know, paleo intensity history is really important. Excellent. Cheers. Um, 
Any other questions before we uh, wrap up today's session? Everyone stunned into silence. Uh, Vadim? Uh, hi, John. Uh, hi. Th thanks for interesting talk. And in your abstract, you mentioned uh, Siberian traps and um, a, a possible relationship to the to to the Icelandic hotspot. So uh, that that uh, may mean that it existed quite for a long time. But at the same time, you say that probably they are younger. So what what is the the trick there? In yeah. Your yeah, I didn't have. I, I decided not to talk about that subject, but but it's a good it's a good point. And and um, so you know, Alexei Smirnov wrote a paper, as you're aware of, and and you've thought about this problem too. Um, um, you know, what motivated our our work on on sub Siberia was really the suggestion. Um, by Julian Folger and other people who were suggesting that you know plumes didn't exist and and whatnot. And one of the arguments that they were making was that um, uh, you know there were um, you know they were making arguments based on the North Atlantic and that um, you know that there were um, geochemical sources in the North Atlantic that could explain uh, uh, the geochemist could explain the geochemistry without plumes. And um, our motivation of looking at Siberia was really to backtrack Siberia. And what, what we found was that, you know, as, as others, and you have found, I believe, that, that Siberia, if we, if we take a broad view of this, Iceland, um, the Arctic volcanism, and um, uh, the, um, and Siberia, they all backtrack to a common area of the North Atlantic in a mantle reference frame. You know, and the reason, again, our paper was that, well, there's so much volcanism associated with that. You know, if you want to rely on an upper mantle source, you can only tap it once. You know, you, you, you can't keep on tapping it. It's impossible. So the people who argue against plumes, that, that's just a, a fundamental inconsistency with understanding the North Atlantic volcanism for that. Now, to get that, to take the, the next question, which is really, I think, to your point, is, you know, is this a really long hotspot track? Um, you know, that's still, that's still a viable question. If it is, it requires, however, a different type of plume. You know, it would have to be a pulsing plume. Um, it would, and there are some geochem, there are some geodynamic models that produce such things. But you have to under, you'd have to explain the gaps, uh, the gap of uh, volcanism in between the Arctic and um, the, um, you know, roughly sixty to fifty million year old volcanism in the North Atlantic. You have to explain some of the gaps from that Arctic volcanism. There are some things in between you can perhaps tie to it. But there are still big gaps to, to uh, Siberia. So um, I think that's still a frontier area for exploration. You know, I think, you know, why do these things all backtrack to the same common area if they don't have some relationship or, or some some form? I think, you know, that's a that's a huge area that I think I don't think that has anything to do with large low shear velocity provinces. I think it has to do with there's something really interesting in that part of the core mantle boundary that uh, produced, if not a feature that is pulsing, uh, uh, has to produce recurrent volcanism or recurrent plumes um, over, you know, 250 million years. Excellent. Thank you very much, John. Um, I think we'll round off today's session. So I think we can all give everyone, uh, everyone give John another uh, virtual round of applause and thank you very much for, for uh, the presentation. Before everybody all um, disappears off to, to whatever else you have planned for uh, today, um, just a reminder that we have uh, a couple of other seminars already into our schedule. We've got another in a couple of weeks time. We will be taking um, a short break for the AGU meeting in, in late April, but then we're back again um, in May 
um, to kick off our seminars again. Um, but if you have missed um, any of the seminars um, across our few years that we've been doing this, as well as some other presentations that we've, we've been involved with, um, please check out our, our YouTube channel um, to catch up with all of our uh, Magnets uh, presentations. And just thank you everybody again for, for joining um, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks time.